page 255 continued. Problems of Transition The history of pre-capitalist social formations in India shows three transitions. The first is from the pre-state and pre-class society to the Varna-divided and state-based society. In India, the ancient Varna may be taken as class. The second relates to the transition from Varna-divided state-based society to a feudal society in which the state is closely linked with land, control and caste divisions which multiply and facilitate such control. The third transition relates to that from the feudal to the colonialist state and society. In Europe, the transition from the feudal to the capitalist society continued for a long time. Page 256. If this transition could be long despite the faster pace of technological change in Europe, the comparative lack of such changes was bound to slow down the process of transition in India. Para. We may touch on only the first two types of transition. Southall does not clarify whether the transition from the pre-state to the state-based society, which he considers to be revolutionary, is brought about by the rise of segmentary state. This state is viewed by him as a form of state and not as a stage in the origin of the state and civil society. He questions the notions of the tribe and the chiefdom, but also takes account of the functioning of a chief. Zagarel's Z A G A R E L L apostrophe S view that the chief has to be generous to please his kinsmen and at the same time he has to collect tributes from them in order to increase his power to, is quoted by him. Footnote 91 The contradiction spelt out by Zagarel acquire meaning only when they are related to the forces and relations of production. Internal contradictions seem to operate more strongly in a food-producing society than in a food-gathering society. In the context of India till today, we have several tribal pockets comprising hunters, fishermen and gatherers of leaves, fruits, etc. It is an enigma that they have not been able to develop their state through millennia in spite of some internal contradictions. The fact that Indian society appeared to be unchanging to the colonialists and radical thinkers in the 17th and 18th centuries eventually gave rise to the theories of, quote, oriental despotism, unquote, and the, quote, Asiatic mode of production, unquote, stop, 92. But the changelessness of many tribal communities in India and elsewhere still calls for an explanatory framework. If one attributes the lack of change to their extreme insularity, what happens to the theory of internal dynamics? Para. Ethnographers and anthropologists may quarrel over the notion of tribe and chiefdom as expounded by service, S capital, and others, but the existence of keen based units of different sizes in pre class and pre state society cannot be doubted. The formation of these units has to be correlated to the modes of their subsistence and also to the climatic conditions in which they live. Keen ordered units differ according to whether people are hunters, slash gatherers, pastoralists, horticulturists, ho, H -O -E, agriculturists, wooden or iron plowshare agriculturists, and so on. Page 257. The term tribe is replaced with the term clan. It does not make much difference so far as its kin ordered basis is concerned. 
various clans could combine to form a tribe in order to promote plough agriculture or similar activities. And similarly, under the pressing needs of subsistence, in a food-producing economy, the tribe might split into clans which might leave the old homeland in search of new pastures and fresh fields. For the same reason and under demographic pressure, clans might split into lineages and lineages might split into families or households. Para. The studies of the Indian tribes make it very clear that the chief exercised his power in his customary right when the British colonialists encountered them. They found it expedient to reorganize that power and make it a prop of their support. Thus, the chief of the Lushais, L-U-S-H-A-I-S, in Mizoram enjoyed certain privileges. As the symbolic head of the community, he was considered to be the owner of the land which was never distributed unequally among his clansmen, at, although each son of the chief could set up his own village and enjoy authority there. 93. Even now, land is not distributed unequally among members of the dominant clan, of the chief or of the sub-chiefs. Only those who possess certain expertise in locating good land are considered better cultivators, receive good portions of land for Joom, within bracket S-W-I-D-D-E-N, cultivation, semicolon. Of course, the best portion of the land goes to the chief himself, 94. It will therefore appear that groups of kinsmen derive privileged socioeconomic status not from closeness to the chief of the clan but from proven special skill and abilities. As the head of his kinsmen, the chief is entitled to a portion of the game hunted by them and also to a portion of their produce as gifts and tributes. This state of affairs appears in many tribal societies of India encountered by the British para. The Mundas are perhaps the most populous tribe in mid-India and the Hos, Santals, Bhumij, Khariyas and other Mundari-speaking clans or tribes seem to have bifurcated from this original Mundari-speaking Munda tribe. At present, the dialects these primitive people speak are closely allied to one another. Large groups of primitive people speaking the same language and dispersed in fairly distant areas certainly suggest the existence of the original Mundari-speaking tribe. 95. But, page 258, the polity of Munda clan shows that they did not develop the state structure marked by a system of taxation, a professional army and an administrative apparatus, ETC, 96. It seems that the methods of earning livelihood based on the primitive Jum or Sweden cultivation supplemented by hunting and other forms of food gathering did not take them much beyond earning their subsistence. It could not prepare the ground for the rise of the state. Para. It seems that the Munda polity is somewhat closer to the segmentary Alur polity. Of course, I would not elevate any polity to a state unless it possesses the identity marks of the state so widely known to historians and political scientists. Among the Mundas, the monkey, M-A-N-K-I, who was the chief of his clansmen living in the village, acted as both political chief and religious head. He combined in himself the functions of the temporal chief called monkey and those of the sacral chief called pahan. In this sense, he represented both political and religious authority. Para. 
The political organization that we find in Amunda village is called Hatu, H-A-T-U, 97. But all such Hatus formed a kind of loose federation called Parha, P-A-R-H-A, which comprised the village chiefs who had split up from the original Munda clan. Thus, Parha is the union of several villages of the same clan located around the village of their origin. 98. It was presided over by the chief of the original clan from which these sub-clans had split up. Para. The sub-clans living in different villages maintained their ritual relationships with the original clan and the soil of their original homeland. They buried their bones in the clan burial ground within bracket Shoshan, S-A-S-A-N, of the original village. They also performed certain public rituals in the Sarna, S-A-R-N-A, or the sacred grove of the parent village, 99, to maintain links with their original home. Eventually, every village came to have its burial ground called Sashan and sacred grove called Sarna. 100. Thus, the ritualistic connections were severed, although the member villages of the Parha continued to function as one in social and administrative matters. 101. When the eldest son of the Parha Raja or chief was installed, the oldest Parha Raja among the invited Parha heads placed the headgear on the head of the successor. Thus, the Parha Raja ritually derived his authority both from collateral Rajas and from the oldest Parha Raja. Page 259 Para such formal ritual relations were maintained till recent times by some Brahmana clans or castes whose members sometimes visited their original homeland. Though members of such clans have proliferated fast, even now they look upon their original homeland with respect. All this may be a relic of the past and in this respect the Brahmanas are not different from the Mundas. However, such considerations do not govern the action and behavior pattern of the Brahmana clans either in their individual or in their collective life. Among the Mundas, the chiefs of various sub-clans maintain loose connections with the chief of the original Munda clan in a stage of social development which shows neither a class slash caste divided society nor a state. The primitive hoe-based agriculture did not allow the Mundas to produce much of surplus and the Munda sub-clans expanded in virgin areas where they did not have to adjust themselves to the local population and develop non-keen bonds. The traditional political organization of the Mundas can in a way be compared to the type of loose organization that we notice in the case of the Alur people. However, the sphere of the Munda ritualistic authority did not extend over the newly set up extended villages for long. Although both the religious and political authority of each chief was confined to the group of villages over which he presided. Para. Whatever may be the defects in the concepts of tribe and chiefdom, the limited evidence available about the Vedic society shows that needs of subsistence led to the formation of keen based groups. The terms connoting keen based groups also denote modes of subsistence such as hunting, foraging, cattle rearing or cultivating 102. It is also clear that the Rajan in Vedic times was nothing but a chief who used to receive voluntary gifts from his kinsmen and compulsory tributes from hostile clans who were conquered by him together with his kinsmen. The same term, Bali, was used for both gift and tribute. 
It is interesting that in the Munda society, Chanda, contributed by the Mundas to their chief, was voluntary. Later, the same term came to mean rent, para. The various rituals connected with the installation of the Vedic chief show that initially he was elected not on the strength of high family antecedents, but on the basis of his mental and physical qualities, page 260, which were tested in the cow raid, chariot race and gambling, 103. By the time rituals appeared, the chiefs and the priests had become differentiated categories. Though they belonged to different clans and even different ethnic groups, yet the convergence of their interests brought them together against the ordinary producing people. Rituals show prolonged struggle between the Rajan and his ordinary kinsmen who constituted the Vis, V-I-S, or the tribal peasantry. In this struggle, the Rajan was supported by the Brahmanas and his close kinsmen. It was as a result of this process that the state was formed. Once certain chiefs and priests came to enjoy some privileges, they distanced themselves from the common people by making their functions hereditary through the invention of the caste system. The caste ideology was therefore very much connected with the ideology of heredity and hierarchy which not only glorified the ancestors of the Kshatriyas and the Brahmanas but also arranged the four Varnas in a graded order. Para. The advent of a food-producing economy in the middle Ganga plains around 600 BC created conditions for the extraction of a good deal of surplus in the form of gifts to religious functionaries. The chiefs of the Kshatriya clans claimed taxes which were supported by the ritualistic ideology of the Brahmanas. Similarly, the Brahmanas' claims to special privileges and gifts were upheld by the Kshatriya kings. The availability of taxes and gifts made possible the maintenance of a professional army and an administrative apparatus which cannot be called bureaucracy in the modern sense. But its functions were not basically different from those of the modern officials. Members of this bureaucracy were not necessarily the kinsmen of the rulers. High functionaries such as ministers or advisors were mainly brahmanas who had nothing to do with the clan of the king, 104. Though they eulogized the clan to which the ruler belonged, only when a complete cleavage occurs between the clan chief and his kinsmen because of the former's attempt to break the traditional egalitarian kin based bond and to leave on the earnings of his kith and kin, not to speak of others whom he had conquered, do we find clear social differentiation leading to a stratified society and the consequential rise of the state power. Page 261 Para. Of course, between the nature of the polity that we have in Rig Vedic times and the one that appears around the middle of the first millennium BC, there intervenes the polity of later Vedic tribes. Times. Later Vedic times. In our opinion, the Rig Vedic polity represents a kind of pre-state society which shows some kind of ranks and the later Vedic polity a kind of proto-state society in which Varnas or classes appear in view 105. However, the Varnas or classes and the serious elements of the state are fully realized only in post-Vedic society which is dominated by the Brahmanas and the Kshatriyas. The former perform religious functions and the latter political functions. These two higher Varnas were withdrawn from the work of direct agricultural production, which fell to the lot of the peasants called Vaishyas and the laboring class called the Shudras. Para. 
This form of Varna divided and state based society seems to have continued till the middle of the first millennium AD when we notice a significant change amounting to the second transition in the history of dominant socio-economic formation at the pan-Indian level. I call this change the transition to feudalism. This transition was helped not by the decentralization of the Mauryan central authority which I emphasized on the lines of my predecessors in 1958-106 but really by the process of land grants made by the rulers to various types of functionaries for the services rendered by them. Not that the process of land grants was entirely absent in earlier times, but it certainly assumed significance in early medieval times. This happened in almost all the areas of the country, which had numerous states, maybe as many as 50, between AD 500 and 700. We have still to account adequately for the widespread practice of land grants in Gupta and post-Gupta times. The suggestion that internal social disorders gave rise to this practice is based on the Puranic descriptions of the evils of the Kali age which appear around the end of the 3rd century AD and the beginning of the 4th century AD. The description leaves no doubt that the Varna Bay state faced a severe crisis 107, especially in those areas which were not sufficiently under the influence of the Varna ideology. Para. In southern India, we have to take into account the revolt of the Kalapras, a tribal people. Around the 6th century AD, the Kalavras, page 262, are condemned in strong terms, not only in contemporary sources, which were taken literally but also by modern historians including K. A. Nilakanta Shastri. They upset the existing social order in parts of South India by resuming the villages that were granted to the Brahmanas. It seems that once they were put down by the combined efforts of the Cholas and the Pandyas, 106, One o eight. The process of land grants was further accelerated in South India. Para. Repeated foreign invasions of the Roman Empire gave shape to political feudalism in Europe. In a state of insecurity, the people chose their lord for protection and surrendered their freedom and, in a way, their independent peasant proprietorship to him. The practice of benefice and commendation originated in this situation. In India, the Huna or the earlier invasions did not lead to such results. On the other hand, around the 3rd century AD and afterwards, loss of long-distance trade with the eastern part of the Roman Empire and also with Central Asia had indirectly affected the political economy of the country. Whatever be the external and internal causes of such a loss, it seriously undermined trade and urbanism and made difficult payment of services in money, which was not negligible in early times. Probably the largest amount of money was spent on maintaining large professional armies. But now the army men and other functionaries began to be paid through grants of land and other revenues, villages, etc., which loosened the control of the state over the functionaries who worked under it. Payment through money creates impersonal relations and means effective control over the employees. On the other hand, payment through land grants enables the grantee to entrench his interest in the area that is assigned to him. Inadequacy of the theory of the segmentary state Saudal admits that the context in which the segmentary state is seen in the Chola kingdom is entirely different from that in which it appears in the Alur society. But except 
for spatial expansion, he neither explicates the dynamics of the segmentary state in the Alur context nor in the Chola context. Page 263. If the concept of the segmentary state has to serve some useful purpose, the causes of segmentation should be clearly stated. The problem of, quote, hiving, H-I-V-I-N-G-O-F-F, unquote, is discussed, pages 61 to 63. The Alur ruling class split into nearly two dozen segments either because the king sent his sons to rule over the outside areas or because the people from those area kidnapped his sons. The first practice can be found in historical times in many societies, including India, but the second seems to be typical of the Alur society. In other tribal societies, segmentation is caused not only by the forced or voluntary departure of the king's sons, but also by several other factors. In the Munda tribal society, hiving off or migration took place because of the oppression of the newly imposed rule of the Nagpur state over the Mundas, 109. Whenever the Mundas found that their communal land system and archaic communal life existing in their village, which were organized into parhas, were threatened by the imposition of taxes and introduction of outsiders, they migrated to far-off areas towards the east and the southeast from the Ranchi Plateau in order to preserve their system of production and to escape oppression. 110. The migration of the Mundas to the other areas from their older homelands led to their complete separation from the original clan. 111. Thus, although we have many instances of segmentation in the Munda tribal society, the process did not leave any ritual or other links between the original clan and the Killis, K I L L I S, subclans. Therefore, the process of segmentation varies from tribe to tribe. Though some tribal practices of Africa may be found in India, yet the type of segmentation noticed in the Alur society is absent in the Munda society. Para. Saudol thinks that the segmentary state can appear irrespective of the modes of production. If this is so, how does it help the understanding of social and economic processes that shape the course of history in different parts of the world? Bipolar political authority and centralization and decentralization associated with the forms of state are well known in history and political science. Historians consider ancient Egypt a unitary state and Mesopotamia a decentralized state. In Egypt, the pharaoh was all-powerful and in the land of the two rivers, page 264, several cities shared political power. Rome is regarded a prototype of Egypt and Greece a prototype of Mesopotamia. The era of city-states in Greece could be considered a period of segmentary, segmentary within court, state. There's a printing mistake. It's posed as segmente, S-E-G-M-E-N-T-A-Y. Chinese history is punctuated with the phenomenon of decentralization in between the stable rule of various dynasties. This is more true of India as has been rightly noted by Burton Stein. But to isolate political processes from social and economic processes will only perpetuate the tradition of old-fashioned political history under the segmentary garb. Irrespective of variables of time, place, ecology, and above all, economy, the concept of the segmentary state loses all its meaning. For understanding historical dynamics, it only stresses political fragmentation. Para. 
Saudol argues that unitary character is sometimes facilitated by small states and sometimes by ecological advantages, but these hints are not substantiated by examples. It is impossible to have one unified theory which can explain the process of segmentation without any consideration for time, place and modes of production. The concept, quote, segmentary, unquote, is applied by Saudol to the Alur society, although he did not personally witness its component polities. The Alur segmentation may have been the usual fission, F-I-S-S-I-O-N, of clans into sub-clans. It may have been clan prolif proliferation or it may have been lineage-based territorial expansion. Therefore, it may be considered a stage of development of polity when keen-based production relations were important. But if it is applied to politics with different modes of production, with feudal pockets containing such autonomous groups as towns, guilds, castes, etc., this concept by itself does not advance the historian's understanding of social, economic and cultural stages or processes. Para. Even the form of the state slash bureaucracy should be seen in the perspective of change. It is not the object of Saudol to explain the birth or the development of the state on the basis of his theory. After all, what is a viable theory and what is the purpose of having a theory? Any viable theory has to be built on the basis of a good number of instances so that it can be used for analyzing and explaining other cases. It should also be capable of explaining change in the socio-economic formation. Page 265 Although the concept of the segmentary state may give an idea of the form of the incipient state in some country at a particular point of time, it does not help us to explain why this form appears and whether it contains elements which work for the change of the state and society from one form to the other. The idea of segmentary form may help us to understand some stage in the origin and maturing of the state, but otherwise the mere dichotomy between the unitary and the non-unitary may be discussed ad nauseum without promoting historical inquiry. Para. Saudol's study of the Alur society seems to betray an undertone of colonialist theorizing. His study of the relationship between the immigrant Alurs and the non-Alur groups which they encountered in their expansion indirectly justifies the relationship between the immigrant Europeans and the tribal people in Africa. He says, comma, quote, that the Alurs, comma, who had a sense of destiny and spiritual mission, comma, were welcomed by non-Alurs as rainmakers, comma, arbitrators, and finally as peacekeepers, unquote, stop, 112. Saudol tends to notice an element of voluntary submission of subject groups, not only to the Alurs, but also to the Europeans, 113. This may as well be compared to the assertion of colonialist historians that the Indians were accustomed to the rule of despots, a view which could justify the autocratic rule of the British Governor-General and the Viceroy, 114. Saudol's view that the political expansion of the Alurs rarely stemmed from, quote, the consciously realized ambitions of the powerful chief, unquote, 115, matches the colonialist historiographical myth that the British Empire was founded in a feat of absent-mindedness. The virtue of absent-mindedness was attributed to the founders of the Roman Empire, it is now being attributed to the powerful Alur chiefs, para. Barton Stein's approach to the study of the Chola state is neither quote Orientalism, unquote, nor quote Africanism, unquote, stop.
It smacks of Euro-centered colonialism which would refuse to credit an early Indian state with apparatus of taxation and bureaucracy which are implicitly seen as European achievements. I neither agree with the colonialist approach nor with Nilakanta Shastri's approach to the study of early Indian history. Yet I gratefully acknowledge the significant contributions of such scholars as V. A. Smith and K. A. Nilakanta Shastri. The pioneering and painstaking work done by Nilakanta Shastri page 266 on the Cholas provides a solid basis for the work of present-day researchers. Because of change in historical methods and approach, his generalizations may be challenged, but his marshalling and categorizing facts, though based on old histori historiography, has not been surpassed by his successors. I am therefore pained to notice the concealed disdain of Saudol implicit in the phrase more august quote, comparisons such as Nilakanta Shastri's unquote, of South Indian villages with Roman cities unquote. Italics mine page 53 Para Stein correctly states that an effective taxation system and bureaucracy does not appear in India till the 19th century, 116, but there is no doubt that these elements were fairly developed in ancient times, though due to localization of authority their character changed with the advent of the Middle Ages. Those who subscribe to the Asiatic mode of production rule out historical changes and processes in India. Such ideas are consciously propagated by the colonialist writers who made an impact even on radical thinkers. In the middle of the 19th century event, Karl Marx could not rise above the intellectual milieu of his times in this respect. Para. As stated earlier, our own understanding of the state basically differs from that Southall. Southall bases his idea of the state on that of Nadel, whose concept neither includes the taxation system nor the professional soldiery, although public officials find a place in it. Following Nadel, Southall lays stress on the importance of central control and territorial sovereignty. But despite ritualistic pretensions, taxation and professional army are two vital organs of the central control and sovereignty cannot be conceived of without their presence. Therefore, in this sense, the segmentary state is a contradiction in terms. Para. However, if Saudol uses the segmentary concept in the sense of an inchoate and loosely organized political system, he has to state it clearly. In this sense, the segmentary state cannot be treated as a prelude to the rise of state. It may be a stage in its origin. It may be of some use identifying the proto-state phase in ancient India. It does not help as much to understand the development that followed the emergence of the state in India after circa 500 BC. Page 267. <clears throat> the heart of the segmentary concept is, quote, the lack of effective political centralization, unquote, page 77. What Saudol has been trying to is to stress the dichotomy between the segmentary and the unitary. Through his, quote, sketchy references to inadequately documented political systems, unquote, he tries to establish the validity of the concept of the segmentary state over space and time as a tool of analysis as opposed to that of the unitary state sponsored by R. M. McIver. 117. This could be appreciated at the abstract level. However, this classification is well known to historians and political scientists. They are familiar with the concept of the federal versus unitary state in the modern setup. 
the quote struggle between centrifugal and centripetal tendencies unquote is also a common phenomenon in the history of all ages and all countries but such distinctions give us only a shallow view of the state they do not help us to grasp the nature of the state structure in social and economic terms the dynamics for systemic change over time are not too clear in the segmentary model 118 para saudol has built his model of the segmentary state on the idea of quote segmentary 119 and multiple system of control unquote 129 One two zero, thrown up by Nadel, taking advantage of Nadel's idea of the binding forces of cultural assimilation. Strangely enough, he ignores a more fruitful insight of Nadel, which relates to the concept of feudalism. Feudalism in the West European context cannot be thought of without the institution of serfdom and manorial estates. But Nadel considers the NUP NUPE kingdoms to be feudal even without the presence of these elements though the NUP kingdom does not really show much of an equal distribution of land 1 to 1 page 118 the two basic classes one comprising landlords and the other comprising a subject peasantry do exist in it 1 to 2 It is obviously in this context that Nadel talks of the feudal estate 1 to 3 in which administrative services are remunerated through grants of land. It is evident that Nadel's understanding of feudalism is the same as that of Marx block. If the Chola and the Rajput social economic and political formations are closely examined they would seem to be close to the feudal state which obviously leaves much scope for loosely organized political structures next page 268 notes